Well, I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me uh, to the book of 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament. I hope you have your Bible with you today because uh, we are going to be looking at Scripture together. And I want you to keep it, keep it ready because you'll have a chance to turn to several places as I'm going to reference a few other passages this morning. In 1 Thessalonians, we're going to look at five truths about the return of Christ. Five truths about the return of Christ. You know, there's so much going on in the world over the last few years. Uh, Michelle re referenced the the war that has been going on uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, prior to that, we had this global pandemic. We now are seeing this escalation of, of war and tensions in the Middle East uh, directed towards uh, the state of Israel. And it just seems as if more and more things are happening that would cause people um, to be alarmed or to grow fearful or to wonder, you know, what in the world is actually going on? And what I want to point you to today are five truths about the return of Christ and how these truths should, in fact, encourage us as believers. So I want to begin by reading verses 9 and 10 in 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 1, and I'm going to ask you to please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word today. If you don't have a Bible with you, then you will find the uh, text on the screens behind me. But I encourage you, if you don't have one, uh, buy a Bible, get a Bible. Uh, you can't afford a Bible, come see me and we'll figure something out. Starting in verse 9. Paul says, For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, that's modern day Thessaloniki. Uh, it's still one of the places that um, still is existing and similar to how it was uh, a couple thousand years ago, uh, even today. And Paul is writing this letter because he had gone on a mission trip there and several had given their life to Christ. A church was established. They are continuing to grow. Uh, people are coming and being part of the church as they give their life to Jesus. And, and he makes a clear point that these people made a decision to follow God rather than follow the world, to trust in Jesus Christ rather than believe and trust in the idols of their day. And so they had given up on those things because they realized those idols were false idols. They were dead idols. And instead, they placed their faith in the living God, Jesus Christ. And he says this. So he says, you've turned from these idols to serve the living and true God. And now look at verse 10. He says, and to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. I don't know if you caught it there, but he says, here's what, you're do here's what you are to do. Here's what you are doing, church, right now. And the same is true for us today. We are to await the return of the Son of God. We are waiting for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Because the one who was crucified buried, resurrected, and who has ascended to the right hand of the Father, He one day is coming again, and He rescues us from the coming wrath. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We ask that You would use it to impact our lives today. As we dive into 1 Thessalonians, help us to see these important truths about the return of Christ, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. When it comes to the return of Christ... Some just don't believe in a return of Christ. Some people out there today, and maybe you're one here today that you've never even heard, you've never even thought about this, but some people don't believe that Jesus will ever return. Maybe they don't believe that because they just don't believe that Jesus even exists. 
Maybe they don't believe that Jesus is alive and was resurrected. Maybe they don't understand that he's ascended to heaven. But there are some that don't believe Christ will return. And that is a a, a bad error to have, as you're going to see in just a moment. Some believe that Jesus Christ will return, but they don't believe that he's going to return in their lifetime. They say, there, there may be some of you today that say, well, you know, the Bible says he's going to return, so I, I, I'll take God at his word there, I believe it, but he hasn't come yet, and it's been a couple thousand years, so I'm not concerned about it. He's not going to come in my day, and so maybe you're sitting there today, and you say, well, yeah, I believe one day Christ will return, but I'm not really too concerned about it right now. Others believe that Jesus may return at any moment. But here's the issue. While some believe that Jesus may return at any moment, some of those same people that believe he may return at any moment are not living like they believe he could return at any moment. Scripture is clear. Christ is on the throne in heaven. And one day, he's coming again. He will return. He can return at any moment. And here's the deal. This truth should impact the way we as Christians live today. It should impact us today. 1 Thessalonians, make no mistake about it, 1 Thessalonians is about the return of Christ. I'm going to show you in this little book how there are in each of the five chapters there is a clear reference in a pointing to the fact that Christ will return and we see the first one here at the end of chapter 1 verses 9 through 10 specifically verse 10 where it says and wait for his son from heaven where is Jesus today well Jesus is in heaven That's where he is. Now, he has sent his spirit to live in our hearts. And so we know that Jesus is with us in our hearts because the spirit of Christ is with us. But Jesus' physical, resurrected body is not in a tomb in Jerusalem. He came out of that grave 2,000 years ago. Well, then what happened? He ascended to heaven where there he is right now. And he is awaiting the moment when he will return to this earth. And what he says that we are to do is we are to wait for Jesus to return from heaven. Now, what does that mean to wait for him? Well, that means to be patient to be confident, and to be expectant on the return of Christ. That doesn't mean to just simply wait doing nothing. That doesn't mean to wait and be idle. That doesn't mean to wait and not believe that he could come this afternoon. But it means that as we wait, we're waiting patiently. We're waiting with our eyes pointed towards heaven, looking for the soon return of Christ. We are confident that he's going to return. We are expectant that he's going to return. It means that we are waiting. You know, it's it's kind of like um, the football game yesterday. I don't know if anybody, there was a game yesterday. Now, if you're a Tennessee fan, we, we know what it's like to wait. We know that when Tennessee plays Alabama, there's two teams you're playing against. One of them's wearing crimson, the other's wearing a zebra outfit. Okay? And, and we wait. We wait a certain way. We know what's going to happen. We don't doubt. We're patient. We're confident. And we're expecting. The refs aren't going to let Tennessee win a game against Alabama. We saw that take place yesterday. Sorry, David, I had to throw that in there. <laughs> right? We, we wait knowing. We know what's going to happen. The Lord's going to return. And as we wait, what are we to do? As we wait, we wait expecting to be rescued. Look at, look at verse 10. Look at it. It says, Jesus, 
who rescues us from the coming wrath. Here's the deal about the return of Christ. The return of Christ is good news for the church and it's bad news for everybody else. The return of Christ is good news for the believer. Uh, It's exciting for the believer. It gives us hope as believers. We have confidence in Jesus because when he returns, what does the Bible say here? It says, we know Jesus is going to rescue us. Now, what's he rescuing us from? It says, the coming wrath. Here's the deal, friends. Jesus is victorious and evil doesn't get away with the evil that evil is doing. Uh, One day, Jesus is going to make everything right, and he is going to be vindicated, and he's going to vindicate us as believers in the church. Here's what that means, friend. That means there's a day coming when Jesus' wrath, the wrath of God, is going to be poured out upon evil and sin and his enemies. But you and I, as believers, we don't have to fear that coming wrath, he says. Why? Because he is going to rescue us, his children, before that wrath is poured out. I want you to turn, hold your place in 1 Thessalonians, but turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. We'll have this on the screen for you as well. But in Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, it's a lengthy passage I'm going to read, but I want to read it to you because I want you to see. This is talking about the coming wrath, the judgment of of Christ when he returns. It says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. Now all of this, just so you know, is talking about Jesus returning. This is all about him returning. He says, He was on a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. I mean, let's just stop right there. Do you see the imagery? Do you hear it here? He's coming to make war. He's coming to battle. He's coming on a white horse as the general, as the conquering king. Did you see? He's wearing a robe dipped in blood. Now, don't get mistaken here. This isn't talking about his blood. His blood was shed on the cross. Listen, his blood has been shed once and for all time for all people. And, and that blood has been shed. And now he's, a, he's coming with a, with a robe that has a different blood on it. It's the blood of his enemies as the warrior king comes riding the horse, putting an end to his enemies. Listen, this is talking about the wrath of God that is coming upon people that have refused to trust in him, that have not lived for him, that have lived for this world and been disobedient to God and it says he's wearing this pure white linen. It says a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. You think these nations are going to get away with what they've done? Nations will not get away with what they've done. Do you think wicked rulers are going to get away with what they've done? No! They're not going to get away with what they've done. Because he's going to come and he's going to strike nations. He's going to strike rulers. He's going to come wielding his sword, which is his word that's coming forth from his mouth. And he will rule them with an iron rod. He will, listen to this, listen. It says, he will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God Almighty. He is going to tread on the winepress. That is, he is going to stomp down the enemies with the fury of the wrath of God. I'm telling you, friends, God's wrath will come. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. His wrath is coming, but guess what Paul reminds us as believers? As we expect this return of Christ, we are reminded he's going to rescue us from this wrath. Isn't that good news? That's good news. It's good news. So expect to be rescued. The second truth I want you to see out of 1 Thessalonians is found in chapter 2, verse 19. So go to, towards the end of verse 19, the, towards the end of chapter 2. Once again, Paul 
going to come to a close of this chapter, and he's going to highlight for us again the coming of Christ. He says, For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? There it is again. Chapter 1, he's coming. Chapter 2, he's coming. And Paul says, who's our joy? Who's our, who's our hope? Who's our crown of boasting? Who is our reward? What is our reward going to look like when Jesus comes again? And, he, and look what he says. He says, is it not you? Talking to the church there in Thessalonica. Talking to the believers there, the Thessalonians. He says, it's you. Indeed, you are our glory. And you are our joy. We, here's the truth. As we wait for the return of Christ, we have a mission that we are on. We know the wrath of God is coming, but that God desires that none perish, no, not even one. He desires for the lost to be saved, and He has called us as a church to be empowered by the Holy Spirit as believers. We are to win the lost. That is, we are to engage this world with evangelism. We are to take this gospel, we're to take this good news, we're to take our faith, and we are to share it with others. See, part of your reward at the coming of Christ, part of your reward and joy in eternity, think about this, is the presence of those that you won to Jesus. I hope you have some people in heaven that are with you that you won to Jesus. Because Paul says when Christ comes again, He says, you're my joy. You're my reward. You're my crown. You're my hope. Because when Christ comes, you're going to be with me. Because we came and we taught you and we won you to Jesus Christ. I go into many houses. Visit with people. And I've I've seen many different pieces of wall art. Some are amusing. You know, they they have little... Fun sayings on them. Some say, all I need is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. But there's one that I saw one time that just, man, it really stuck it stuck with me. Because most of them don't make a lot of sense, and they're just wrong theologically anyways. Okay. But I was in this one house. There's a piece of wall art. And it said something along these lines. It said, there's only one thing from this home that can come with me to heaven. And it said, my family. Man, I started thinking about that. Because we know, I mean, you can't take anything to heaven with you when you die. Hey, that's why empty your bank account and give to forward by faith. Because, listen, it's not coming with you. Hey, you can get buried in the most expensive and elaborate casket that there is, but guess what? That thing's going to corrode and decay. Listen, you're not taking it with you. You can get all your jewels, you can get all your money and pile it in the grave with you, but it's not going with you to eternity. It can just rot in the ground. You can't take your car. You can't take any of your possessions in your home. Listen, if little Johnny breaks something in the house, it's okay. It's just a thing. It can be replaced. Little Johnny can't be replaced. And you can't take any of that stuff with you. But did you know there actually is one thing you can take? There is one thing you can take to heaven with you. It's another person. It's another person. It's another soul. It's your family. It's your spouse, it's your kids, it's your friends, it's your co-worker, it's your neighbors, it's the person down the street, it's the stranger out there, it's that person in Brazil or Jamaica or China or Africa. It's people all over this world that you can go and you can share the good news with Jesus and you can say you can give your life to him today and he will save you and you'll have a home in heaven and when Christ returns, you'll be with him forever and you'll be with me. You can take a person with you to heaven. And, and, and that's what Paul is talking about here when he says, listen, while we wait for the return of Christ, 
We must be engaging in evangelism. We must be telling people about Jesus. Who are you going to have with you when Jesus returns? Anybody going to be with you? Who are you going to have with you when Jesus returns? I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but you can make a reference on this. We'll put it on the screen. Acts 1 says this. He says, After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood up by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Listen, this is right after Jesus has been resurrected. He has spent 40 days with his disciples. The people have been seeing the resurrected body of Christ, physical body of Christ. And he ascends before their eyes to heaven. And everyone's gazing up into heaven as they saw him go. And the angels appear and they say, Hey, buddy, listen, why are you standing there wondering what you're supposed to be doing? The same Jesus the same Jesus with the same body that you just saw ascend to heaven. Guess what? He's coming. He's coming. You know what Jesus had told them in verse 8 right before that verse 9? Here's what he said. But you will see power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses. You know what Jesus was telling us? The same thing that Paul is reminding us. That while we await the soon return of Christ, we are to be about being a witness, sharing the good news of Jesus with people in our lives. So let me ask you again. Are you actively sharing your faith? When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you sought someone out and you said, I know our preacher's going to preach the gospel, so I'm going to invite them to church because I want them to hear it. They might get saved. When's the last time you have shared your faith? When's the last time you've invited someone and brought them with you and said, I'm going to take you to lunch afterwards. That's how bad I want you to come to church. I'm going to tell you, you got a good opportunity. On November 12th, when Rock Collins is here, you need to be right now praying about who, who are you going to bring with you that needs to hear this message. Who will be with you when Christ returns? Now, the third truth. Look at chapter 3, verse 13. He says, May he make, this is in 1 Thessalonians, May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. There it is again. He closes chapter 3 and he says, Remember, he's coming. Don't go to sleep on it. Don't forget it. Church, he's coming. Now, part of why this is so impactful for the church in Thessalonica was they were going through severe suffering. They thought, is the, has the wrath of God, is it being poured out right now? Like, what's going on? We're suffering. People are being martyred. People are dying. They're like, what's happening? And, and, and Paul said, just remember, he's coming. Have hope. Have confidence. He's coming. And, and what is he doing while we wait for his coming? Well, the Holy Spirit is at work in us. You see it in verse 13. He says, He make our hearts blameless in holiness before God and the Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget it. God is holy. What that means is God is set apart. He is unique. He is unlike anything else. He is God and He is God alone. And there is no other and there is no one like Him. And it's impossible for anyone to be like Him. He is God alone. He is holy. He was without sin. He knows no sin. He is perfect. He is God. God calls us to be holy, though, the Bible says. He says, as He is holy, you be holy. The issue is, 
We can't be holy like God is holy because God is God alone. But here's the thing. God works in us to make us like him. It's a thing called sanctification. So God sanctifies us. He takes us in our weakness, in our fallenness, in our sinfulness. But when we've surrendered our life to Jesus, the Bible says he sanctifies us. So he does make us holy. There are three tenses of sanctification. I'm going to give you two now and one at the end of the message. The first is the positional part of sanctification. That is the past tense of sanctification. Sanctification happens in the past tense. That that means this. The moment you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified in the past tense. That means you have been set apart by God to God and for God. It happens the moment you are saved. He sanctifies you. He saves you and he sets you apart unto himself. But then there's also a present tense sanctification. It is a progressive sanctification that's happening. That is, God is currently working in you as a believer, as a Christian. So right now, you should expect while you wait, for Jesus' re- Jesus's return, that God is actively, through the Holy Spirit, working in your life to make you more holy, to make you more and more like Jesus every single day. How does he do this? Well, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, and the Holy Spirit uses the Bible. And so as you take the Bible and you read the Bible every single day and study it for yourself, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He takes the Word of God and He uses it to wash you and to sanctify you every day, making you more like Jesus. So you act a little bit more like Jesus. Are you acting more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Are you thinking more like Jesus today than you were a year ago? Are you talking more like Jesus than you were a year ago? That's what God's desire for you is. And as you walk with him, and as you open yourself up to him, and as you get into his word, and you pray, and you come to worship, and you live for Christ, Jesus sanctifies you. He makes you more like Christ every day. A great way for you to grow in your sanctification is for you to attend a small group. Being a part of a small group. That additional study of God's word where the Holy Spirit's going to take that and he's going to do a work in your life through God's word. Fourthly, look at chapter 4, verse 15 through 18. He says, this is a beautiful passage. It's t- the, 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 the Thessalonians are asking, what about all of our family that's, that's died. Their lives have been taken. Our friends, our church members that have that, that they've already died, like what's all this mean for them? What's it mean for us? He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming. There it is again. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Look at that verse 18. Encourage one another with these words. While we wait, God is doing a work of strengthening us. Of encouraging us, of empowering us, of comforting us. When when the Lord returns to rapture his people, he says, those that have died already, their bodies are going to be raised from the graves. And then those that remain that haven't died, we will be united with them in the air. We will meet the Lord together in the air. 
Encourage one another with these words. See, the return of Christ should be an encouragement to us. Some of you, you've had a loved one die in the last couple of years. Others, you're going to have experience stuff over the next few years. And the Lord wants to encourage you with this truth. Death doesn't have the final say. That when a person dies, their soul, it, it, it's going to keep living. And it's either going to go to heaven and be with God, or it's going gonna, it's gonna to go to hell. And then one day, the Lord is going to come and he's going to raise these old dead bodies out of the ground. Because he has a future for us. And that our soul and spirit is going to be reunited with these bodies that are going to be raised by Christ when he returns. And he says, listen, I want you to encourage one another with these words. Now, here, here's something that's important at the end of verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. One another. Who's the one another? Just prior to that, it says, it talks about we, we, we. The reason it says we is it's talking about believers. It's talking about the church. The one another is us believers. It's us, the church. How can you and I encourage one another if we're never together? How can we encourage one another when we don't faithfully come on the Lord's day to encourage one another? Did you know you encourage me when you're here on Sunday? You just do. You ever think it discourages people when you're not here? It does. I'm just going to tell you. Because we need one another. And we need to encourage one another. Because we're all going through things every single week. And we need the full body of Christ to gather together. And to encourage one another with the word of God. What are we encouraging one another with? With these words. I don't want to encourage you with my word. I don't want you to encourage me with your word. We're encouraged by these words. And after Paul writes this down, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, God gives him this, and he talks about the, the coming of Christ and the fact that the dead in Christ are going to be rise, and we're going to join him in the air. He says, encourage one another with these words, the word of God. Now, finally, we're closing. I want you to see this final place in chapter 5. Verses 23 through 24, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again. Chapter 1, he's coming. Chapter 2, he's coming. Chapter 3, he's coming. Chapter 4, he's coming. Chapter 5, he's coming. And he says... Look at verse 24. I love this verse. Look at this. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, verse 24. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. In case you didn't get the picture. The Bible's not just saying it might happen. He's saying it's going to happen. He will do it. Now, what's he doing here as we wait and as he comes? Well, here's, here's what it is. He will glorify us. He will glorify us. You see it here. He says, sanctify you completely. What does that mean? Completely sanctify. Well, that's the third and final tense of that sanctification. We have the past tense. We have been sanctified. We have the present tense. We are being sanctified. And then we have the future tense. We will be sanctified, also known as we will be glorified. That's the future, the ultimate glorification. Here's what that means. When Christ raises 
the bodies out of the grave or those of us that remain and meet him in the air, at that very moment, God is going to glorify us with glorified bodies. We will be given a body that is suited for the new heavens and the new earth. We will be given a body like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. We'll be given a body that can eat and can drink. We'll be given a body that can laugh and enjoy the things of heaven. Listen, we'll be given a body that will have no pain and no suffering. We'll be given a body that can't shed any tears of sadness, but maybe only some tears of joy. We'll be ha- we will have a, a body unlike anything you've ever experienced. You will run and you will not grow tired or weary. You will jump higher than you could ever jump. You will soar like you've never soared. It'll be unbelievable. Remarkable. You'll be able to explore the new heavens and the new earth. And it'll never get, told, it'll never get tiring or boring. You'll be given a new body, hear me, that is free from the desire of sin itself. A perfect glorified body that's what we await as we wait for the coming of Jesus Christ don't lose hope don't lose expectation don't be discouraged by what you see happening in the world today no friend You get your eyes looking towards heaven. You get your eyes looking towards the clouds. And you say, I believe Jesus is going to come. And while I wait, I want him to keep doing a work in me. And I want to tell people about this good news. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us today be encouraged by the fact that Jesus, you are coming again. Lord, you're not a dead God, you're a living God. You're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you, Christ, are Lord.